good morning uh, good afternoon good evening everyone wherever you are around the world my name is vikram rao and uh, i'll be the moderator for this session and uh, we'll be now starting with a wonderful session called security practices for developers and i'm very happy to welcome uh, prima virani on stage the speaker for this session uh, hey prima uh, are you all set to take over yes Hello everyone good morning and good evening to anybody who is uh, on my side of the world i am in san francisco at the moment so it's about 10 o'clock for us that night and 10:30 in india i think um so yeah today my session is going to be about secure coding practices particularly for developers and um, i'll start by introducing myself a little bit So I'm an information security professional. I've been working in this industry for the last eight years now. Um, I've worked in various industries. I started working in oil and gas, and then um, you know have been working in tech, various types of tech companies um, for the last five years now. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about myself, and um, I think I'll dive right into the presentation um, because it's. going to be a little long um uh, we're covering you know a whole range of topics here today and i hope you enjoy it as much as you know i enjoyed uh, preparing it and you know working on it so um, i'll start with some of the challenges that um companies face while trying to you know do security work um most small to medium sized companies um have this um you know attitude where fixing security issues sometimes comes uh, as an afterthought and um, most of us uh, who have been in the industry for a long time know that fixing security issues after the code is live is you know a little bit of a um, it's a, it's a difficult task it's not easy at all and then you know if the attackers exploit um, the particular issue and if it results in a, into a breach then that's you know even bigger of a problem um and then you know attackers as we all know it uh, have a virtually infinite amount of time to find bugs in the code whereas you know um, developers who are on the uh, creative and defensive side of things uh, have an infinite um, time and uh, sorry a limited amount of time and limited amount of resources that they can uh, put towards development so the um, what i'm trying to say is the attackers have a significant upside um, in trying to win this battle against the you know good folks so to speak and the thing is most small to medium sized companies don't manage to survive through public breaches they it costs them so much especially if they are in you know financial space and if regulatory bodies uh, come into the picture then it, a breach can be extremely expensive um so you know the best uh, kind of prevention uh, the best cure in this case is prevention and um secure coding practices is one of the preventative ways i mean um it's a very broad term and there are so many sub categories underneath it um i'm going to talk a little bit about how exactly we can achieve it um and you know some specifics so uh, i think the biggest overarching principle uh, to follow here is um this principle called security by design um and that you know security and secure development has to be embedded into the development process itself and um not come you know it shouldn't come as an afterthought um and security by design um can you know be further divided into uh, smaller more manageable more achievable chunks such as um, the you know less here input validation output encoding authentication management session management communication security and you know there are a bunch of other topics such as um, system security database security file management and memory management as well they are equally as important uh, as the ones highlighted the five highlighted on the left um, however the latter the last four system security database security file management and memory management are going to be a little bit out of the scope for this particular talk because um you know those areas are more relevant to sysadmins and um sres more than the developers themselves so today i'm going to try and stick to uh what developers specifically and you know people who are uh 
creating an application or an application ecosystem can do. Um, and so, you know, the uh, four lat latter four are going to be uh, out of scope here. So let me start with, you know, um, talking a little more about security by design and, you know, what it really means. Um, so the role of any security team um, is to enable other teams to write more secure code. Um, in a lot of cases, security teams um, are, are not necessarily part of development, but they are part of review um, in the you know entire development lifecycle. And sometimes what tends to happen is security gets this rep reputation of being the no sayers, you know, the people who are um, saying no often, more often than not. And um, I just want you all to know that even when the security teams do that, they're, um, you know, the intention there is to try and, you know, be um, as thoughtful as possible of the company's overall security posture and so on. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, us as security people, we try to uh, always, at least good security people always try to make sure that, um, the, you know, with even if no is the answer, uh, we always try to come up with an alternative instead of just saying, oh, no, you can't do that. Um, the right approach to take generally is to go and say, oh, you can't do this, but there are, you know, th these three other things that you can do instead, potentially. Um, so think of your security team as the brakes on your car. They are intended to you know help you go faster and um, that's the you know job of a great security team in my opinion um so i'll start with um some of the security by design practices and you know uh, this is a prere prerequisite for all the other principles um to be followed appropriately um, design applications or features with security top of your mind invite your security team to collaborate um, if you can, uh, if you have the resources, if the team is big enough, um, I know those can be challenges sometimes. Define the security policies in the architecture itself. So this is a very good way of making sure that security doesn't come as an afterthought and it's embedded in the development process itself. Um, threat modeling is a very useful and um, a very, um, you know, a kind of, uh, it's a very giving uh, exercise um, to go through that um, gives the team a lot of opportunities to try and mentally map and model scenarios in their heads about um, what to anticipate in the kind of application that's being built. So I'll talk a little more about threat modeling because it's a very interesting as well as a very um, involving subject. Um, I, I won't be able to discuss everything under the sun, of course, but I can discuss uh, kind of some of the high levels there. So how to do threat modeling is basically, you know, there are four main things that you can try to do. Number one is identify and note down the most valuable assets. You can't protect what you don't know. Um, it's always, um, you know, great idea to know exactly what is it that you're trying to protect and why exactly you think it might be under threat. Um, create an architecture over, uh, overview of the uh, particular ecosystem that you're trying to protect. Um, and there's an optional step here where you can decompose the application. Um, what that means is that you decompose the architecture of your entire you know, underlying network, your host infrastructure design, um, create a security profile for the application. And the aim of the security profile is to uncover vulnerabilities in the design implementation or deployment configuration of your ap application. Again, I know that sometimes this decomposing part can be a little bit of an overkill. So, you know, it's um, of course your and your security team's uh, discretion to um, choose um, whether or not to uh, go that route. Um, then the next very important step is identifying the threats. So, uh, you know, when uh, identifying and documenting the threats can be a real interesting thing where if there's the uh, approach of, you know, fear, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty and doubt, what we call FUD, um, everything looks like it could potentially come and harm you. Um, that's not necessarily the most practical approach because in any given scenario, uh, there'll be maybe like two or three, um, you know, most high priority things that would 
actually qualify as threats uh, when it comes down to you know uh, I, uh, thinking about what's the likelihood of you know that threat uh, that threat actually exploiting our network so for example for a financial company a more likely threat would be um, someone like you know your regular kind of hackers uh, cyber criminals external threats um, versus you know for um, uh, I mean uh, hacktivists or what you'd call you know environmentalists and um, state sponsored um, hacks might not be as big a risk as your regular, you know, script kiddies and um, opportunistic hackers uh, might be. So, you know, those thinking about those things can inform the approach that you can take and the strategies that you devise in terms of what to protect and how to protect it. Um, the last and the most important thing, as I mentioned earlier, is to rate the threats. Not every threat is going to be the top, you know, top most high priority. Um, and of course, document each one of these um, using a common template that defines the core set of attributes that, um, you know, that captures um, each threat. So uh, that will give you an opportunity to evaluate um, and stack rank these almost against each other. Um, and last but not the least, um, there, there's a lot of information available on how to do threat modeling. Um, on, you know, there's a popular, very amazing, um, useful guide published by Microsoft. They've also um, published a tool that you can use for threat modeling. And I've provided a you know long list of resources at the end of this presentation, at the end of this slide deck that um, I'll make available um, later once you know we are um, uh, done discussing everything. And you can hopefully you know find some of those resources useful and valuable as well. So identifying the most valuable assets um, is basically, you know, identifying the, and pondering on the following questions. Does the app or feature deal with personally identifiable information or financial information or healthcare information? The reason I talk about these three uh, before, you know, anything else is um, because these three are scrutinized. They are regulated by policy, by law of most of the countries um, in the world that, you know, tech businesses are currently established in or are running in. So um, it's very important to protect these three at the very least. Um, of course, there's your, after you're done, you know, thinking about these three, there's your employee data to protect, there's your uh, customer data to protect and so on. Um, but if, you know, you're dealing with any of these three, you should especially be careful. Um, what are the most valuable assets? So, you know, uh, clearly record and track um, things like subsystems, trust boundaries. Uh, trust boundaries can mean, um, you know, something as simple as um, of basically where does the data come into, um, for, uh, where does the data come from, where does the data go to, and within your application, what kind of processing happens, what should come in and what should go out and what should absolutely not um, leave your uh, specific ecosystem that you're trying to develop or protect. It's very important and very um, useful to think about those things. Um, then, you know, think about how is the data protected while it's in transit? Um, are your networks encrypted? Uh, can, you know, um, anybody uh, on your network practically sniff um, all of the sensitive data? If that's the case, then, you know, you, um, you might need to think about a strategy there to um, implement and to an encryption between those two sources um, in between which data is flowing. And then um, design is something that, you know, you need to think about network and host infrastructure, how it all uh, talks to each other and so on. So uh, the top most important things to think about are data in transit and data at rest and how it's how exactly it's protected. It's very important for a team to know that. Uh, especially when dealing with sensitive data. Identify and document threats again. Um, and, you know, internal threats are 
equally as important as external threats. And I want to highlight that because, um, you know, uh, often when carrying out this exercise, um, in of course, you know, we, again, within the company itself, we don't want to create this environment of kind of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt as well. But at the same time, um, we must always kind of um, leave that room for doubt of, you know, so, uh, of an occurrence like that um and so on and internal threat plus external attacker is generally the most widely used uh, strategy uh, in a lot of the successful massive public breaches so there is this um um, you know very public breach that happened a a couple of years ago actually four years ago now um it uh, the victim here was a company called shapeshift.io it's a popular crypto company and um the uh, their story is fascinating and um, you know this is one of the quotes from that article that um in this case the hacker the external third party hacker was so surprised and appalled by the internal person who was trying to help him basically hack into the company successfully that in one of the correspondences with the company employees um the hacker said that even though you know i said cease communication can you still send me an email when bob gets sued because uh, that bob person was the internal person who uh, helped this hacker get into this company's network successfully and this was the hacker saying that i feel really shitty uh, that i feel it's really shitty to steal from your own employer something that this internal person did you know so um, go out and read this story it's a very fascinating read um, and it's full of drama um, but yeah always be mindful uh, and you know make sure that you capture the inter- possibility of uh, an internal threat at all times because uh, no matter how trustworthy uh, everybody is uh, you just never know and um, as i mentioned earlier rate the threats not every threat warrants an action um, so prioritizing is a very important uh, task to do here. Um, generally, the priorities are determined by um, likelihood and impact of a particular threat. How likely it is that something like this can happen? And if it does happen, what's the blast radius? How much damage can they make? And this damage can be, uh, you know, in form of the, you can assign a dollar amount to it. Um, if it's, um, you know, if the organization is, of course, that mature and the um, assets that you're trying to pr- protect are so well defined, um, th- um, that's one of the best ways of identifying impact um, of, you know, a, a potential threat manifesting itself into a breach at any given point. And of course, you know, work on the most significant first, um, the highest priority should be addressed first, uh, followed by the um, uh, next priorities and so on. Um, so yeah, security by design. Let's talk about input validation. These are, you know, these five uh, main line items are some of the um, most important key areas to think about while trying to implementing these security controls in the um, design itself and in the architecture itself while trying to develop an app or application ecosystem. So input validation is, um, you know, the uh, basically craft the art and the craft of making sure that your data, uh, when whenever you, uh, whenever your application is taking in input from uh, your consumer, it's um, always properly formatted. Um, it helps make sure that. Um, SQL injections, LDAP injections, and uh, so on don't happen. So what an attacker can do is basically they can, um, you know, uh, enter uh, garbage-like looking text um, followed by some, you know, special characters and so on in order to uh, basically gain access to your back end using just the front end. They don't even need to hack into any of your, the database, the uh, host that hosts your database or anything like that. They can literally, the front door, the front end can be the front door through which they enter into your back end. Um, so uh, making sure that for input validation, it's important to make sure that, you know, there's syntactic validation as well as there's semantic validation. 
and um, you know um, the structured fields so for example social security number or tax file number um, these should be you know digits only um, this should be limited to 12 characters for example um, and date time should always be you know uh, the uh, two letters for a uh, two numbers for uh, the day two letters uh, two numbers for the month and two uh, and four numbers for the year and so on. And restricting this uh, makes sure that, uh, you know, the attackers aren't able to enter special characters in the form fields that they're trying to uh, exploit. And also make sure that there's, you know, you check for the correctness of their values. So the start date should always be before end date and never after. Um, and the price should be within expected range and so on, because the attackers can manipulate that to get an error, which can be, you know, which can reveal a whole lot of interesting, sensitive information. And that error dump can be then used to um, um, exploit something further. So, um, you know, just be aware and mindful of it. And this is an example of an SQL injection attack where, um the attacker is able to um, basically in the password field, they are able to enter the password uh, or, you know, uh, one equals one and then um, enter the script that they want to enter in order to get the data, the um, dump of the entire database and so on. And um, in a lot of cases, this is not only good security practice, it also optimizes your code for performance. So, you know, this is um, input validation is it saves you both, you know, in some cases, computing cost and also helps you stay secure. Um, use native data tape validators that are available in various web application frameworks. Um, those are, you know, optimized uh, for performance and for security generally. And remember that JavaScript needs both client and server-side validation because if you're doing only client-side validation, then, you know, an attacker can bypass it using a web proxy and um, or, or a web browser where that disables that, uh, using which they can disable JavaScript and so on. Uh, refer to OWASP. OWASP is a very, very useful resource um, to, you know, refer to for great security practices. They have a ton of cheat sheets uh, that they publish that you can follow. It's literally a checklist of things that you can do, you know, and I have provided everybody with a link uh, for those at the end as well. So let's talk about output encoding quickly. Uh, this is the, you know, process of converting untrusted input into a safe and formatted input. This is, you know, this practice always assumes that your, um, uh, the uh, um, c consumer is going to enter garbage data. And when they do, uh, this is, uh, I'm already predefining the logic of what I do with the garbage data that's, enter that's being entered. So um, uh, this also, you know, helps make sure that we display input to the user without executing it as code in the browser. And uh, with output encoding, um, uh, the developers can make sure that they always translate special characters. So that, again, helps um, prevent those SQL injection possibilities and so on. And uh, this is a very good mitigation against uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability as well. Um, let's talk quickly about authentication management. This is one of my personal favorite topics to talk about as well because it's very thorough. Uh, it can seem complex, but it's uh, kind of, some of it is very common sense. Um, so yeah, um, let's talk about authentication management. The, this is actually the most you know popular and obvious of all controls as well. Um, it's all about verifying identity, making sure the app always knows who it is that who's trying to get into the ecosystem, what kind of access that they're trying to, um, you know, what kind of access do they have uh, to the resources that they're trying to access. And um, of course, do not allow logins with sensitive accounts. So for example, uh, admin logging in with admin should uh, if possible should be you know prohibited and so on and even if it is allowed um the interface that and the options the functionalities one get 
when logged in as an admin should ideally be different to the functionality that one gets when logged in as a regular user. This helps make sure that even if somebody is able to exploit um, the admin, you know, login credentials, for example, um, they are not able to uh, do too much damage. So this helps narrow down the blast radius and then uh, implement proper password strength controls as well. Um, there should ideally be different authentication uh, solutions for internal access versus public access. So, you know, with internal employees, it is usually possible to implement uh, key-based authentication and so on. Um, and that ideally, you know, uh, should be done. Um, it helps make sure, uh, it helps the company make sure that um, the employees are always, so, uh, and um, because in order to authenticate, um, one would always, uh, to authenticate as an internal employee, one would always need these uh, set of, you know, private keys and so on, uh, which are slightly um, more difficult for attackers to compromise as opposed to passwords. And remember, encoding is not encrypting. If you can revert it, it's encoded. If it's uh, if you can't revert it, it's encrypted. That's the you know easiest way to remember uh, what is encoding and what's encrypting. Encrypting will almost always be one way, and um, uh, only store um, you know uh, salted hashes. Um, don't never store plain text passwords um, ever. Um, display, you know, generic authentication error messages. So uh, your error message should never show uh, exactly what went wrong. It should be just generic enough for the um, uh, con consumer to know that something has gone wrong. Uh, this kind of, this is a little bit of an security by obscurity technique, uh, but it really works. And um, enable multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, I know in India at the moment, it's particularly popular. Almost every app that you're trying to use uh, has, uh, you know, this thing where they send you an OTP uh, before successfully logging you. In, and that is a, you know, very good uh, security measure. But at the same time, with, you know, uh, uh, all these attacks on the telephone providers and carriers themselves. Um, it can be really easy to transport, you know, the uh, these SIM transport attacks uh, can be really easy to carry out. So um, solution to that is to make sure that um, um, the users can use uh, authentication application as well. So something like Duo or Google Authenticator um, and, you know, providing the consumer with the choice of using either OTP uh, sent through text message or through generated through this authenticator application uh, can be really useful. And um, make your application, you know, password manager friendly. People should be able to, you know, copy and pay, basically paste passwords into various form fields and so on. Uh, your um, uh, people using, you know, password walls should be able to quickly fill out the form from within the wall itself. You can enable all these functionalities to encourage users, both internal and external, to use the password management tool, which helps them create really long, uh, secure, complex passwords. Um, again, account lockouts and captchas also increases fric friction for um, uh, attackers uh, and, you know, helps, uh, hope, hopefully helps keep them at bay um, from exploiting the application successfully. Um, let's talk a little bit about session management here. So um, uh, session management is basically, um, you know, uh, once the consumer or any user has established a session with your application by, you know, authentication, uh, authenticating successfully and so on, um, the app at all times should be aware of uh, who that user is and how, um, you know, they can prove that they are who they claim to be. So uh, the session IDs, uh, session IDs are, you know, a popular way of conducting session management and ses uh, session ID names used by the most common web application development frameworks um, uh, tend to be, you know, it discloses the technologies, the names of the technologies and programming languages used by the web application. So uh, if possible, you can, you know, change that um, and make it more generic so that it doesn't kind of, um, give out all this information. And then uh, minimum length uh, session IDs uh, prevent, you know, um, 
brute force attacks and so on. Uh, session timeouts are really important. Um, implement idle timeouts, absolute timeouts, and you know renewal timeouts. So idle timeouts are basically it limits the chances of an attacker um, for guessing um, and using you know valid session ID from another actual user uh, who successfully logged in at the moment. Um, absolute timeouts limit the amount of time an attacker can uh, use a hijack session for in case they are able to hijack a session. Uh, so this is a you know what you'd call an onion model. Uh, this is a layered approach where you prevent one measure, but you also allow for that measure to fail and have like a what you'd call a backup measure in case measure number one fails. Um, and that is generally a pretty good security strategy overall. So yeah, um, session management again uh, mitigates against session writing and cross-site request forgery attacks. Um, um, help you know manages uh, session IDs appropriately and then uh, change session ID names as I mentioned earlier from default to generic. Um, minimum length of session ID should be 128 bits um, or six, 16 bytes at least, and the entropy should be 64 bits at the very least. Um, use pseudo random number generator as well. Um, and then, you know, for sessions, uh, make it strict, never accept user generated session IDs, uh, treat it like any other input, basically validate it and implement timeouts, as I mentioned earlier. So that's kind of, you know, a summary of um, everything that we've covered earlier. And um, a simultaneous session logons um, uh, use built-in, you know, session management frameworks, use web application firewalls. Simultaneous session logons should be uh, kind of, you know, limited as well in nature. Um, sessions are usually managed through cookies. Cookie management is a topic of its own and, um, you know, that again is out of the scope for this particular talk, but I really recommend you go online and, you know, read about it. OWASP again is a very good resource to look up this information. Log all the authentication and session activities. This really helps uh, if an attacker is successful. If an attacker is successful, um, it really helps uh, if you have logs available and ready to surf through of all the activities that went on uh, in order to trace um, your steps back to when you know the attack might have started, what might have happened to recreate that entire story that unfolded essentially. Logging um, all your sessions is, it, you can't go wrong with it as, um, pretty much. And communication security, that's kind of, you know, the last of the methods that I'm going to discuss today here. Um, implement TLS for all communication. So this is basically making sure that your data is always protected while it's in transit from point A to point B. And uh, implementing TLS is a very good way and a very popular way of doing that. Um, there's a website called Let's Encrypt. It, it's basically an open certificate authority, and it lets you obtain a TLS certificate for free. Um, so this is basically if you want to make sure if, um, your website is always on HTTPS, Let's Encrypt lets you do it for free. Of course, there'll be, you know, um, manpower and, you know, uh, sysadmin's time that potentially goes into it, in, into implementing it, but the actual resource itself is free. And um, disable TLS compression, reconsider, um, you know, the use of wildcard certificates, um, try and limit it as much as possible. Wildcards are, you know, convenient, uh, but, you know, the likelihood that the private key or the certificate is comp gets compromised increases. And um, as the key may be present on, you know, multiple systems, additionally, the value of the key is uh, significantly increased because suddenly it's giving you access to, you know, 10 resources instead of giving you access to maybe two resources. So makes it, it makes it more lucrative and an attractive target uh, for the attackers. And uh, the attackers generally can see if you're using the wildcard certificate. Um, if, you know, your uh, Chrome web browser has that little padlock on the left corner, um, through that, they can actually see the entire certificate chain and who your certificate uh, authority is and how they, you know, um, uh, basically issued your certificate. They can see that all those details. So be mindful of that. And, um, uh, you know, use CAA records, um, restrict 
which uh, so CAA record is a certificate authority uh, authorization DNS record. Um, it can be used to define which uh, certificate authorities are permitted to issue certificates for a domain. So what this makes sure is that a Chinese a company uh, or like a attacker is not able to issue a certificate under your name from a dodgy third party Chinese um, certificate issuing authority, for example. Um, and uh, that, you know, of course, helps you stay protected. It narrows down who can issue certificates for your company, for your domain. And um, uh, a page that's available over TLS should not include any resources um, such as, you know, um, JavaScript or CSS files, which are loaded over unencrypted at HTTP because then it kind of, you know, defeats the whole point of you're using the same resources, uh, both in, uh, you know, while encrypted uh, communications are there and unencrypted. And um, these unencrypted resources could allow an attacker to sniff sessions, uh, session cookies, uh, or inject malicious code into the page, uh, even um, on your uh, HTTPS pages. So be mindful of that. And again, you know, um, these are some of the kind of general, other general good practices, system security, um, be mindful of these things, uh, database security, patch, uh, patch all your systems, all your databases, follow the principle of least privilege. Um, the uh, employees also should, only be able to access the minimum amount of information that they, they'll need access to at any given point of time to be productive. And uh, make sure you do file management appropriately, uh, protect the local file system from unauthorized access, um, and perform memory management. So these four topics were the ones that you know I couldn't cover today uh, because they were out of scope today, but um, these are uh, definitely for you know very important things to be mindful of and discuss with your sysadmins or SRDs. So with that, um, I will open it up to questions. And um, again, I hope you found this session you know useful. Um, all the resources are available at the end of the slide deck, which I will make uh, public at the end of this uh, conversation. So thank you so much. Hey, Prima. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the session. It was wonderful. Um, you know, I've been in this space as a developer for a long time, so I had a question. Uh, I'll probably we wait for the audience to, you know, throw their questions too. So you said about wildcard certificates or not, uh, you know, think about it, right? So right. what is what could be the wrong uh, problem with wildcard certificates? Right. So uh, the, one of the biggest problems with wildcard certificates can be that um, it so um, they are generally used on multiple resources. Right. And uh, that makes uh, that means that if the certificate is if that one certificate is compromised, it's compromised in n numbers of your system that you're using the wildcard certs on. Um, and also, you know, through um, the uh, any kind of what you call it a seasoned smart attacker will always examine your website's uh, certificate chain, who is the issuer, because they can always try and compromise the issuer directly as well. Uh, and that actually has happened in the past. It doesn't happen so often anymore, but um, it does happen. So um, they will examine whether or not you're using wildcard certs. And if they see you do that even publicly, then, you know, they will probably, it will be more of a motivation for them to try and compromise it because no, because they know that um, there are multiple potential resources that they could get access to, potential sensitive resources versus, you know, just one. And um, uh, that is a good enough motivation for somebody to go after it and chase it. And uh, not using wildcard search. Of course, make sure your blast radius is narrow and that you're not giving out that motivation to the attacker to come after you, essentially. OK. So we have a question from Harpal Singh, uh, if you want to check that or you want me to read it. Yes, I am actually reading it right now. So I think Harpal is saying, uh, what basic competence is needed for a developer to understand the need of embedding security in day-to-day -day work? Is this specified anywhere? Yes, it is. And I'm so, so grateful and glad that you, you know, asked this question. 
So um, OWASP is something that I mentioned uh, through my kind of uh, presentation quite a bit as well. OWASP is an organization that specifically creates resources for uh, developers, people who are not full-time security professionals. Uh, they create resources for developers to use that um, you know they can potentially kind of leverage uh, while you know while in the process of um, de creating their own applications and can be mindful of and they give it to you in a very palatable like checklist format so you're not you know reading through a wall of text at any given point of time uh, it's just a one or maybe like two three pages uh, of you know checklist to go through and you can just quickly glance through it and uh, make sure oh yeah done this done this done this done that um, and wherever confused they also provide you with you know detailed kind of uh, information and examples of um, what a particular attack entails and um, what it would look like and what you can do to mitigate it so go check it out i've included the link to these resources uh, at the end of my slide deck uh, there's actually a resource section uh, i can quickly show you that as well so this is microsoft Gri microsoft's guide to threat modeling there's a django validator apache validator owasp cheat sheets then you know all the different very specific cheat sheets as well um, so please go check it out um, i hope you find it useful Can you explain, um, I'm reading Gaurav Verma's question. Can you explain more on accessing accounts? Admin should avoid logging in with admin account? No, that's uh, not what I meant at all when I said that. So there are kind of multiple uh, you know, things that um, we can make sure that uh, to make sure, uh, multiple things that we can do to make sure that um, uh, your admin accounts uh, function. So the one of the most important things uh, to do is to make sure that uh, your admin accounts are, you know, there are no generic just admin uh, accounts. So every admin account even should um, be traceable to an individual at uh, every given point of time. You should be able to trace an individual's identity with every admin, you know, login attempt. Uh, that could be a part of uh, how you design the admin account. So, for example, um, you know, each admin account should be associated with an actual user with a unique username and password. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, if you know this is not possible, um, another way of doing it is to make sure that uh, the um, um, logon, you know, attempts are recorded and it's recorded uh, where you know each uh, admin session is coming in from from which IP and so on. And you should be able to go downstream and associate that particular IP's identity with a user confidently and um, you know successfully. So that's one thing. Another thing is that every, um, so admin account doesn't always need the same level of functionality um, as a regular user account. So for example, as an admin, I might only need to make sure who different users are and whether or not their accounts are enabled or disabled. And uh, I probably need the functionality to enable or disable their account, for example. Whereas a regular user account um, that's not an admin account, they might have the uh, capability of carrying out the you know actual what happens uh, to a particular consumer's data and so on. So if you, if you can to um, separate those two functionalities out, um, and make sure that you know admins are able to access the bare minimum they need, and then the non-admins are able to access the bare minimum that they need. Um, that's usually a good practice. Again, I understand it can be a little complex to implement and so on, but that's the this is the generic idea that I'm you know, describing. So I hope that answers your question. Um, do we have time for a couple of more questions? So maybe one more question and uh, then people can go for a break. Yeah, okay. uh, we can take uh, maybe another five minutes. Uh, so whatever we can cover in that time. For sure. Um, is there any tool developers? Um, I'm reading At Atresh uh, Krishnapa's question. Is there any tool developers can use uh, and ensure all of us check checklist items are addressed and a uh, piece of code is written is compliant with security requirements? Um, 
I, I don't remember them on top of my head at the moment, but I'm sure they exist. But I also know that um, even the ones that exist are not very mature yet. So, you know, the rate of false positives in terms of what it will flag that, you know, you haven't implemented, uh, that tends to be really high. So at the moment, unfortunately, the best way of doing it is uh, to do it manually. Um, but that sounds like a great area of opportunity for, you know, the next kind of wave of startup founders, I would say, and uh, try and make that more efficient, more automated. Um, but, you know, it's also harder to implement because um, each of these functionalities are implemented differently in each different framework. So the way Jan uh, you implement it in Django might be very different to how you implement it in Node.js and to, you know, create a solution for every single one of these stacks um, can take a while. So, yeah, that's kind of the scoop on that. Um, okay. Um, could you touch upon very few basic security practices that DevOps engineers should practice where they are involved in continuous deployment? Yes, I can talk about a few things um, in context of AWS, particularly because you know that tends to be the platform that's um, the most kind of popularly used by a lot of DevOps engineers. And uh, uh, one of the ways of making sure that you know uh, one of the most kind of basic ways of making sure that security practices are adhered to is to make sure that um, you uh, you know none of the changes that are being made on the platform itself can be made directly through the console, uh, and they should all be probably pushed um, as code through a uh, you know third party tool like Terraform or something equivalent of it. And uh, whenever these changes are pushed, um, the you know a security should probably be one of the mandatory peer reviewers. Um, if it's not, you know, too much of a kind of a time suck or a hassle, uh, then, you know, security teams can then kind of jump in and glance through the particular uh, piece of code um, or change that's, um, you know, being pushed and uh, see uh, if they can, um, you know, see any kind of security issues with it. And that's one of the kind of easiest and quickest ways of doing that. So um, make sure that all of your infrastructure is, or as much as possible of your infrastructure is uh, written as code and uh, modifications to them are being done in you know GitHub, not on AWS directly. Um, okay. For uh, transferring large files over FTP, what security threats we should be mindful of? So FTP inherently is insecure. It's not in encrypted and it can be sniffed very easily. Uh, try and use SFTP wherever possible for large file transfers. Another uh, somewhat of a hacky but slightly more secure way of doing it is um, use apps like Dropbox, Google Drive, and so on. They are literally made for this purpose, and there is an entire team working on securing these transactions and these connections so, so that you don't have to worry about that implementation yourself. And um, it's kind of done, you know, out of the box for you. Um, it's, you know, they, they are very easy to use tools and everybody, it's very intuitive as well. So try and, you know, advocate for those where possible. Um, because, you know, to build everything at every time is uh, A, not possible and B, not feasible. Uh, it might cost you more in the time that you're spending in trying to implement those versus the benefit you are getting out of those. So always consider that kind of cost benefit. Okay. Um, thanks, Prima. I think we kind of have run out of uh, time. Um, so it was a wonderful session and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much.